representatives of uh, diplomatic corp dear colleagues uh, members of uh, passe representing uh, national delegations let me welcome you to this site event launched and organized uh, with uh, the participation of uh, Moldovan delegation to Passe. Uh, side event dedicated to an overview, uh, discussions, open discussions concerning Transnistrian problem. Uh, last events, last developments. Uh, this topic is of uh, the tremendous importance for the Republic of uh, Moldova. The key speakers, or the most important persons for this site event, uh, will be the representatives uh, of uh, civil society from Moldova, <laughs> namely Mr. Chura, representing the foundation of modern democracy, and uh, Mr. Postika, representing also a well-known NGO in Moldova, Promolex, dealing uh, during many, many years uh, with the issues related to a uh, Transnistrian problem to this item. I would like to thank you for your presence uh, to this uh, site event. That, from my personal point of view, uh, shows the great interest you pay to this uh, indeed important um, issue that is important not only for my country, Republic of Moldova, as Transnistrian region is the legitimate territory of the Republic of Moldova, but this is an issue regionally important, important for regional security and European security. How to resolve by peaceful means the Transnistrian problem? So it is a deal of political will. You know that uh, negotiation process uh, is held in the five plus two format of negotiations. We are pledging for the activization, dynamization of this format of negotiations. Uh, we have a strong will to resolve this problem, bearing in mind all the particularities of the situation and of the region we talked, we talk about. And I believe that uh, my colleagues uh, representing important NGOs in my country will come with important details and after their presentation we'll leave the necessary time for an exchange of opinion and for answering all your questions. Thank again and I will pass the floor to Mr. Cornelio Ciura. I think I have a right to deliver some uh, thoughts about the Transnistrian conflict uh, because I am a member of a joint expert group, Transnistrian Moldovan expert group of civil society experts who deals with Transnistrian issue. It was created by CMI, Crisis Management Initiative. And also I uh, mm, uh, deliver lectures about Transnistrian conflicts to uh, foreign students. So uh, um, I will try to present the Transnistrian conflict not from a point of, from historical point of view. You know, I think enough about this. I would, like to, I, I would like to place the Transnistrian conflict in a regional context to describe the Transnistrian conflict shortly in comparison with uh, other conflicts which exist in the region. And later I will just give some clues about possible solutions for the Transnistrian conflict. So first of all, I would like to shortly describe Transnistrian conflict compared it with other five, unfortunately, conflicts which exist in the region, I mean, Donbass, Crimea, South Ossetia, Abkhazia, and um, Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, first of all, I will mention that the statute of Transnistria is still, unfortunately, and unrecognized. This is not true about South Ossetia and Abkhazia, which are partially recognized by several states, uh, and uh, not true about Crimea, which is an annexed territory. So uh, Transnistria is a frozen conflict, 100% uh, let's say frozen conflict, because there is ceasefire, there is political agreement, there are some political agreements, and there is a peacekeeping mission and security zone in, in, in this region. So, 
Uh, the basic idea, as Mr. President told, is that uh, there is just one way to settle the conflict, the peaceful one. I would like just to mention that there are some other conflicts in the region, in Ukraine, in uh, Georgia, where the idea was to defreeze the conflict, to maintain its hot statute. And this is another approach how we can deal with, with this conflict in the region. In Moldova, the basic understanding is that there is no way to start again warfare or to keep them alive. And the second idea, which was also mentioned by Mr. President, is that from the point of view of many observers, the Transistian conflict is the easiest to be solved. Unfortunately, this, uh, this is true, of course, and we understand this because there is no ethnic premises uh, here in Transnistria, in Moldova, ethnic rivalries. In Transnistria, we have people who are of Moldovan, Russian, Ukrainian origin, like in, on the right bank, ra ra like in, uh, uh, on the right bank of River Dniester, which is Moldova. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we can see that this conflict is not yet solved, so probably not right tools were used in order to, or maybe not enough tools were used to, to, to settle the conflict. Uh, so uh, let me say a few words about um, the Transnistrian conflict settlement process. About the position of two sides. I don't want now to mention the position of foreign actors, but according to Moldova, the Transnistrian conflict should be solved in the format of sovereignty and independence, independence of uh, Moldova. There is even a law, law two, of 2005, where this idea is expressed very clearly. Many actors don't like this law because uh, saying very bluntly that uh, sovereignty and, and independence of, of Moldova is the main prerequisite for, set, for solving the Transnistrian conflict, maybe is not, do not, give enough manev uh, maneuverability to, to, to actors in, in the negotiation process. But still, this law is valid, and the official position of Moldova is that only sovereignty and the independence of Moldova could serve as a base for conflict settlement. Transnistria could receive only uh, a statute of political autonomy, extensive political autonomy, autonomy, maybe asymmetric political autonomy. Asymmetry means that Transnistria could have more rights than other regions of Moldova. But uh, nevertheless, don't forget that we have another aut aut autonomous region, Gagauzia. So in this case, we could have two uh, autonomies, but only as autonomy. This is, of course, not in line with the uh, position of Transnistrian authorities. They would like to have maximally a confederal state. This is the maximal concession they could make. Uh, the other options they had, have in mind are civilized divorce, complete independence, and even incorporation by Russia. They also sometimes take it into account. Uh, there are two important negotiation processes uh, related to Transnistrian conflict. The first is related to political negotiation. We have a five plus two format composed by five actors, uh, Moldova and Transnistria as actors, involved actors, OCCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe as uh, mediator, and two guarantor state, Ukraine and Russia. You can see a big problem here. And pl plus two, two observers, United States and the EU. According to Moldova position, and there is a document now uh, which will be very soon prepared, a conception of Moldovan authorities about the Transnistrian conflict settlement. So according to our position, uh, we would like to raise the statute of observers, to transform them in mediators. So United States and the EU should become, according to uh, the point of view of many experts and politicians in Moldova should become uh, mediators. Um, another, this is the single problem we have with this five plus two format. So no changes, we consider that this format is legitimate. 
it has the right to decide about finding the final political solution, but we would like to, to change the, the format of the statute of uh, United States and EU also. Uh, we would like this format to deal more with the final solution of political settlement, because in recent years, this format was much more involved in problems, minor problems, let's say, problems related to uh, ecology, to economic issues, and we would like to focus more on final political settlement issue. This is the main ideas which we have rela uh, about this, uh, uh, this five plus two format. On the other hand, Transnistria and sometimes Russia would like more this small step approach to discuss minor issues and to adjourn, to postpone finding the po political settlement at some point. We don't know when. Another very important issue which is related to negotiation process is of course military and peacekeeping question. So in Transnistria we have two military groups. We have peacekeeping operation, which is legitimate, and Moldova accept the presence of this uh, Russian, uh, Transnistrian, and Moldovan peacekeepers, and especially Russian peacekeepers. They act in the security zone totally legally, and we accept that, their presence, but we would like to change the, stat the statute of this mission. We consider that uh, this military mission is no longer valid. There is no uh, perspectives, for, real perspectives for war in the region. So we don't need militaries anymore. And we would like to transform this mission into a civilian one under international mandate. This mission, the current mission, is the result of 90, 1992 agreement between President Eltsin and Snegur and it was, it doesn't have an international ma mandate. Even the Commonwealth of Independent States mandate is, no, uh, is not applying to it compared with Tajikistan, for example, or of Abkhazia. And we would like to give to it an, an international mandate. Maybe this is a problem which organization would like to, to become uh, the issuing authority of this mandate. So, uh, uh, and maybe this mission could be preceded by an observe, mission of observers, an international observing mission which could evaluate the situation in, in the region. So this is our approach towards uh, the peacekeeping operation. Of course, tra uh, Transnistria and Russia, because sometimes this is a kind of two plus one format, two, I mean Transnistria and Russia and one Moldova. Transnistria and Russia, uh, don't want to accept such a change. So this is an important contradiction in the negotiation process. And few words, just uh, one minute, few words about guarantees. So how can we, the very sensible issue is giving guarantees to Transnistria to make them to accept a final uh, settlement. According to many documents, we are able to give them guarantees of properties in Transnistria, so those who possess property in Transnistria will keep it. Uh, Transnistria is free to choose its way in foreign policy and uh, if, if Moldova change, changes its statute, so this is an important guarantee for them because they are very much afraid that if Moldova will transform, will become, for example, part of Romania, I just, uh, say uh, repeating their arguments not not mine so they should have the right to for self-determination so in this case as as many unofficial documents say it is possible to give them this right and they would like to have and we are willing to give them extended political autonomy transition would like more in this uh, regard they would like to have blocking power in the parliament and government uh, disproportional representation in parliament, and uh, very important for us, maintaining Russia, uh, Russian army on our territory. So this is also a very um, contentious issue between us and the Transnistrians, the issue of guarantees. Thank you very much, Mr. President. That's, that's all.
uh, which um, is an organization uh, who, which provides uh, legal aid and uh, assistance strategic litigation before domestic and international courts, monitoring and reporting. Thanks to the support uh, of uh, our partners, uh, through years we promoted the European values uh, for people across Moldova, especially for people who live in Transnistria region. We elaborate a lot of studies, reports, uh, researchers regarding human rights violations in Transnistria region. We are the organization uh, uh, which uh, represented beneficiaries uh, uh, before the European Court of Human Rights. Um, uh, we assisted uh, more than uh, uh, 60 cases uh, before the European Court of Human Rights um, uh, on regard of uh, people from uh, left bank of River Nistro. Uh, we also represented school case and farmer cases uh, before the European Court. Only these two uh, cases involved more than uh, 2,000 people uh, of uh, applicants. Uh, you will see in the hands out uh, um, uh, recent um, uh, judgments of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, which provide uh, more information about the human rights violation uh, and uh, regarding um, uh, people uh, from uh, this territory. According to our studies and the findings of international experts, we can state that um, the following uh, problems uh, uh, is pre uh, are present for this region. The Transnistria region does not have any institutions that would examine independently and impartially the violation of human rights. Uh, due to the lack of international control, the phenomenon of impunity is uh, uh, widespread and encourages uh, the perpetuation of order by some person or institution that have a coercive role in this region. Uh, Transnistrian administration is involved in many illegal schemes of expropriation of businesses and uh, human rights violation. In Transnistrian region, human rights defenders, uh, 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 human rights activists, bloggers, and other uh, other civil society actors were subjected to intimidation and harassment, including judicial harassment, restriction on freedom of expression, association, assembly, movement, and arbitrary detention. The situation deteriorated uh, during these years uh, with the work of human rights defenders uh, being seen as subversive and uh, an attempt to undermine the regime and the local administration. The case of Promolex is very relevant in this regard because uh, uh, starting with 2015, uh, so-called uh, MGB, uh, KGB uh, from uh, the, this territory opened a criminal case against Promolex and uh, our members because we represented um, a lot of cases before the European Court of Human Rights. So we face up to 15 years uh, of imprisonment if uh, they uh, <coughs> take us. <coughs> Uh, thanks to the support of uh, including uh, uh, assembly, uh, parliamentary assembly and the INGO uh, and the resolution from 2016, uh, these problems uh, was presented to uh, this uh, assembly and we thanked uh, uh, those who support this uh, resolution. Uh, according to the ministerial uh, statement on the negotiation on the Transnistrian settlement uh, process in the 5 plus 2 format, uh, 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 from uh, Hamburg last year, uh, the delegates called upon the sides to engage constructively and regularly uh, in outcome-based meeting of uh, 5 plus 2 format <coughs> with fully empowered political representative to achieve tangible progress uh, in all three baskets, including humanitarian issues and human rights. So um, I discussed with uh, many politicians, uh, representative of uh, structures, and they asked why should we focus on human rights uh, is human rights are more important than the uh, sec uh, security in the region or political resolution? I consider that uh, human rights uh, <coughs> should be based of all decisions taken in the context of this uh, uh, resolution. Uh, we f will not challenge the impunity and we will uh, not be sure that human rights are respected. Any decision taken in this context will not be executed properly. The recent case of former so-called president of Transnistria region, Evgeny Shevchuk, is very illustrative in this regard. In 2015, when the criminal case was opened against uh, Promolex, uh, <coughs> uh, he openly declared that all civil organizations which are focused on the human rights litigation are foreign agents and uh, that the scope of this organization uh, is to terminate the statehood of so-called republic. Moreover, he stated that uh, this uh, would provoke the new conflict. 
Uh, during his mandate, Evgeny Shevchuk and so-called Minister of External Affairs Nina Shtansky uh, asked to close criminal case opened by the General Prosecutor Office as a fact, uh, or, or a fact of applying torture and human treatment during arrest of people in the penitentiary system of uh, um, Transnistria region. They argued that they would leave the negotiation if constitutional authority would uh, not close the cases because the Prosecutor Office does not have any competence in this regard. In December 2016, in the Sinsen region, presidential elections were held, and uh, the new president became into, <coughs> uh, um, for, uh, let's say, uh, Vadim Krasnoselsky. Only after a month, after the new, uh, newly, um, um, newly so-called president uh, entered and in, uh, into function, he declared that almost six, uh, uh, six. Uh, um, criminal case were open against Evgeny Shevchuk and that he faced up to 12 years of imprisonment for fiscal frauds. After this declaration, Shevchuk left the region uh, to Kishina. Today, Mr. Shevchuk plead not guilty for fraud committed in uh, this region and asked General Prosecutor Office from Kishinev to open criminal cases against the administration uh, from left bank of River Nistro. Uh, in fact, he presented a lot of information about human rights violations committed by the administration uh, of Transit region. I think that this case is very relevant uh, for whole negotiation format and prove that there is no problem with the people who live there. But the problem is uh, the administration of this region, uh, which in fact does not represent the population but have their own interest. Um, during uh, the recent years, uh, human rights situation in Transnistria re region remained unchanged. We can point out uh, some of the um, major uh, problems uh, with the human rights in this uh, re region. First of all, um, uh, this is about illegal detention and the torture. Torture cases uh, in Transnistria region are not incriminated, and uh, uh, the use of torture by the police uh, militia representatives uh, and, uh, or other forces structure is tolerated. Uh, uh, when they want to obtain testimonies uh, from retained persons, uh, including self-incriminating uh, ones. Therefore, people from uh, the Transnistria region do not notify the recognized authority about any torture cases. Uh, even though the report of the local ombudsperson, so-called ombudsperson, indicates that uh, mm, he, it receives complaints from uh, uh, about the use of torture by the prisoners, uh, he failed to react in any way. Uh, the kidnapping uh, phenomenon was uh, still used by the force structure in the Transnistria region, and we uh, revealed these uh, cases and uh, uh, sent to the European Court of Human Rights uh, many cases on this regard. Liberty and security in Transnistria region is the second most problematic issues, uh, issue. Uh, in 2016, uh, the, European, uh, the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights pronounced the judgment in the case of Moser ver versus uh, uh, Moldovan Russia. Uh, which is extremely important since it analyzes um, the capacity of the judicial, so-called judicial system of uh, the Transnistrian uh, Republic to order the arrest or detention of person. In uh, the said judgment, the court underlined that, <coughs> contrary to the constitutional law, which was subject to uh, expert review and monitoring by uh, several international bodies, the so-called legislation, legislation that applied to Transnistrian region has never been subject to uh, review. Thus, arrest and sentencing decision taken by the so-called uh, uh, ju uh, judges uh, and the prosecutors um, mm, uh, cannot be uh, considered as legal. Uh, the, the third problem is, uh, is uh, military units. As uh, uh, my colleague said, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in Moldova, we actually have uh, uh, three armies. First of all, uh, first of all uh, it's uh, about uh, uh, legal constitutional army. The second one is Russian troops. And the th uh, third one is most problematic in this regard is the uh, so-called Transnistrian army. And uh, the uh, biggest problem is the enrollment in these military uh, units. The forced enrollment in the paramilitary structure of the region continues to be practiced by the so-called uh, authority. There are no statistical uh, data with regard uh, to this phenomenon. We presume that hundreds of young men, citizens of the Republic of Moldova and uh, all the other states uh, who are living there, uh, were enrolled in this uh, uh, Transnistrian army uh, by force. Uh, we send uh, to the European Court at least uh, two uh, very important cases regarding uh, um, death in these uh, paramilitary units in the very unclear uh, circumstances. 
Uh, as I said, the freedom of expression is uh, a very important uh, uh, issue, and uh, actually, um, because of uh, so-called uniformization of uh, the uh, legislation, let's say so-called legislation uh, uh, from Transnistria region, they try to uniformize uh, to. Uh, to take uh, some, uh, um, let's say, um, legislative acts from Russia and uh, to apply it to this territory. Uh, uh, you will see in these handouts uh, other problems like uh, freedom of movement, uh, rights to education is very uh, crucial uh, issue, and uh, rights to own property also uh, I highlighted in these handouts. If you have any question, please. I'm happy if we have NGOs independent NGOs, which are dealing with in, a, in such a conflict. Only in that you know, the subcommittee of conflict between member states have on, in their agenda the frozen conflicts uh, that includes Transnistria, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Nagorno-Karabakh, but also, which is not under OSCE, by UN, uh, the north, north of Cyprus. And we have the new, it's not frozen, and the new conflict between member states, it's Ukraine, Russia. We started three years ago uh, in this committee. At that time, there was another name, but this is not important now. And uh, we rise up in an agenda where we want to start. And uh, we started the Vienna talks with uh, Transnistria because we underline what the NGO said, also what Marianne Lupu said, that is the weakest frozen conflict because there nobody is dying at the ceasefire line. There is no ethnic question and no racism question or a religious question. And uh, we invited for the talks because uh, from all of those conflict, by goodwill of both sides, or we can say by goodwill of both sides plus one, by absolutely neutrality of Romania and Ukraine, this is important in that way. Uh, we can go ahead in this conflict to find a solution, but that means it's not only a solution what the Moldovian government is thinking, because at the end it must be a compromise and a, also a guarantee, uh, a guarantee from the, for the Transnistrian side to be in a state, and I'm speaking only for the state of Moldova and not any dreamers of unification with Romania, then we come to the end of the road if we are talking about that. And I think inside Moldova and outside Moldova, uh, that is the reason normally you can invite the neighbors to, to help, to mediate but in this case, not. And this is the, uh, the reason why Council of Europe and uh, see there uh, really a perspective to work because also our focus is always first on people who are living in frozen conflicts uh, because those are the poorest, not the politicians in con frozen conflicts because they are able to traveling and to move and to do. Um, not what they want, but they can organize a lot. But people who are living, kids who are going in schools in Transnistria, or who has the right to speak Moldovian, or who, what are the rights of minority. Also in Transnistria, we have minorities and not only uh, one population. So, and, um, and we need on both sides of such a conflict uh, institutions, uh, uh, institutions of uh, which uh, representing uh, rules of laws for all. And um, we, we had a, 
discussion, the 25th of September in Athens, also on, on, on the case, also on the case of uh, Transnistria conflict, with uh, OEC Ambassador Heim, and on 16 on November we go ahead on this conflict uh, with the talks in Paris. Uh, we uh, st we never we broke the. The, the umbrella of OECE, because the 5 plus 2 format is the responsible. The uh, uh, Council of Europe only wants to help because there are family members and we are inside the Council of Europe. Our rapporteurs cannot uh, uh, investigate uh, what is under the control of a frozen conflict. So uh, we will give an impulse of talks and perspectives and also of models, which could be a good model which can work. Uh, I, you stressed out the case of Gagausia. I learned, don't mix those two uh, autonomous questions, uh, then you get the problem. So I decided, I was the first who invited the, the Bashkan from Gagausia to the Council of Europe. I'm very proud about that because it was the first contact with Council of Europe. Uh, but I don't want to mix it. But at the end, there must be a constitutional solution for all, but it's different. And that it's different, uh, uh, it's also a different discussion. When we speak about Transnistria, we don't mix it with uh, Gagausia don't, and because we don't want to make mistakes uh, and that the doors be open. I'm not speaking today about other frozen conflicts. Please accept this. Uh, I, uh, maybe somebody want to ask me to other conflicts. I'm not speaking about other conflicts because all these things are sensible enough and uh, I had this feeling yesterday after the debate about uh, our report uh, about another member state and immediately I get the question of a conflict. I'm not speaking today about other conflicts. So uh, I'm expecting really the, the long list of frozen conflicts that we solved in the peaceful way. I can present you the longer list of conflicts that were solved, really solved effectively, but not in a very peaceful way. So this is this is this is this is one 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 interesting thing. Now the second thing what I want to um, to say, I know the conflict. I know the conflict. I know, but now we are solving the problem. How to how to name the university? How to legalize the car plates? How to legalize the diploma? But the nature of the conflict is not on diplomas. The nature of the conflict is not on the car plates, not on the name of the university. The nature is elsewhere. And it looks for me, I'm not obliging you, I know, I know conflict in Abkhazia and Karabakh, but it looks for me, you know, like we have sickness, we, we are ill, but we understand what we are too weak to, to solve the problem, to, to, to heal ourselves. So we are healing the consequences. And all these things, you know, as the national stadium in Tiraspol airplane, um, car plate, and these, these are consequences. We are somehow forgetting what the sickness, the illness is not in Transnistria, yes? The sickness is in Moscow. And sincerely speaking, it's a, enough one simple the decision in Kremlin and you will, don't need, you will not need to legalize the car plates and uh, name the university. So, but uh, you know, and we know, but there will be no decision quickly. So we are solving a small consequences of the big conflict, uh, uh, calling it peaceful solution. And my question supposed to be, you said, you said the uh, uh, special status of Transnistria in Moldova. Is it your happy solution that makes you happy, or is it a solution that makes happy some, somebody else? So I, I'm sure that special status is not invented by you as the best solution. And you are saying this is okay because, because, because 
we and you and we, Council of Europe, we are too weak to solve, to, to heal the, the, the disease. So we are making them uh, sick people a little bit feeling better, but still sick. So I'm sorry for that radical idea, but it's theoretical, yes? And in practical way, I understand, Mr. Shenak, you are doing very nice job. I'm also do, doing something to, to calm people, to, to make a compromise solution. We are diplomats, we know how to do that. So, looks like in the time being, we agree to make the partial solution, to make someone happy, but for the time being. Okay. We should define correctly what happened. Definitely it was no speaking about the transition conflict. It was no, it was not indeed an ethnic uh, conflict, it was purely political and strategic, geostrategic conflict. This is the first definition. The second, <coughs> we were speaking about the fact that the format 5 plus 2 currently established from the beginning in a time when the Republic of Moldova was very weak, a new independent state, some other players were tougher, they put it on an equal fit footing, a state, the Republic of Moldova, and an entity, separatist entity. This was the moment. And from the beginning, it started in a very delicate uh, situation. Um, and here, we have to define a second element, the important element. We are listening all the time, all sorts of things coming from Tiraspol, from Moscow, whatever. We should define who was the victim and who was the aggressor. It's a very simple thing. When dealing with, with the conflict, we should define very clear who was the victim. And for all the foreigners that maybe they don't agree, don't understand, don't see the nuances, let's, have, let's take a, a clear objective reference. Let's take a decision of the European Court of Human Rights on a famous case established in 2004 the case of Ilashka and the others against the Russian Federation and the Republic of Moldova. In that decision of the jurisdiction, European jurisdiction of human rights, is very clearly defined who was responsible for starting the conflict. It was Russian Federation. 14 army and the support for the separatist regime. Point. So this was the fact that who was the aggressor? And who was the victim? The victim was the Republic of Moldova. It's extremely important for the management of the, of the peace process, including for any presidency of OAC dealing with the format 5 plus 2. The fact that we can, you, you cannot put in reality on equal footing the aggressor and the victim. This is a very direct political uh, assessment coming from a member of the parliament without any governmental responsibilities that might make me much more conservative in my public expression. But it's extremely important to have clear, clearly defined when having political discussions. Now, the second comment uh, uh, following a little bit uh, what uh, Stefan mentioned. And I'm obliged as a Romanian official to do it uh, officially. When speaking about languages, Moldova languages and so on, we can play politically or without having the proper knowledges about this. We can define or redefine based on political interests, like the communists leading the Republic of Moldova, like the socialists are doing, but the identity cannot be rewritten or redrafted. It's the identity, and I can assure every foreigner around this table beyond the Moldovan colleagues and the Romanians, that we can speak together without translation directly in the same Romanian language. With Marian Lupu, with the Moldovan ambassador, with Valeriu Gireci, with all the ladies and gentlemen around this table. So when we are making reference, we can make reference also to the position of the Moldovan Academy of Sciences, of a famous decision of the Constitutional Court saying that the so-called Moldovan language and the Romanian language are the unique language. An official, as an official uh, uh, representative of the Romanian state, I was obliged to underline this. My question is the following one. <coughs> Beyond the political strategic discussions, I'm interested from the two uh, panelists, what are the consequences, because it's much more profound, speaking of a possible formula of reunification. 
what are the concrete consequences today of the association agreement of the Republic of Moldova with the European Union as concerning the free trade agreement? What are the concrete let's say, inputs related to the economic environment from Transnistria entering in the free trade agreement with the European Union? Is it working? Is it advancing? There is interest from the economic actors from Transnistria. What is the level of involvement or at least interest? And if there are possibilities to advance, because when you establish economic bridges, it's a little bit easier on the political discussions to advance in a certain reunification of the Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, dear colleagues, we are already in a kind of time deficit. If, if somebody has some questions to the panelists or to me, I'd like to ask you to address those questions. Uh, two, three, and then to leave uh, the remaining time for uh, our panelists to answer them. If not, I will ask Cornelio Chura to answer the question of uh, uh, Mr. Kolvatsyan. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, madam. Yes, please. Thank you for giving me the floor. My name is Kat Pilhas, I'm deputy German representative of Estonia. Uh, uh, the previous uh, speaker already uh, touched uh, on the topic that uh, I would like to ask too. What is the economic incentive of uh, people uh, of Transnistria to push for the change and uh, for the solution? How would you describe the uh, um, economic uh, or corruption or poverty or wealth the situation of the Transnistria people in comparison uh, with Moldova uh, and uh, uh, whether the EU-Moldova uh, um, free trade uh, agreement would, uh, would help uh, uh, Transnistrian people to see, uh, to be motivated to, for the change. Thank you. Very interesting question. Some other questions? No. So, let's proceed uh, to the answers to the questions of our distinguished colleagues uh, uh, from uh, Estonia and Mr. Uh, Kovetsan, because in fact, as far as I understood, it's more or less very connected to the questions. Economic incentives, the CFTA, please, Mr. Chairman. According to an agreement in 2016, Transnistria agreed uh, with the EU, and although of course was present as part of this deal, to postpone the implementation of DCFTA in Transnistria. And uh, it is using now uh, uh, trade benefits uh, which were valid for Moldova to, 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 before entering the association agreement. So the political decision in terms of entering Transnistria DCFTA was to postpone till the end of 2017 the implementation of uh, association agreement in Transnistria, the entrance of Transnistria in association agreement. Moldova accepted this deal. Uh, from my point of view, uh, this deal helped Transnistria just to uh, postpone the situation because as far as I know, they don't prepare themselves for entering the association agreement and to become a full-fledged member in economic terms. Uh, that, that means abolishing uh, taxes, uh, abo creating a new tax system and abolishing tariffs uh, in order to become a um, uh, free trade area. So, uh, to my mind, Transnistria is playing politically with EU, trying to benefit from uh, having this preferential trade system with the EU, but not prepare themselves for uh, entering uh, free trade area, DC, DCFTA, deep and comprehensive free trade area. It creates advantages to Transnistrian uh, businessmen in comp compared with Moldovan business. business. So they use preferential system and we don't. So, and this is quite a, a problem. We don't know what will happen at the end of 2017, but we should follow this, because according to the agreement, 
in, at, the, at the beginning of 2018, Transnistria should ask for becoming, should abolish tariffs and become a member of the association agreement as part of Moldova. And this is a very, a very important uh, detail. But I am sure that they are not ready for doing this. And here the ball is on the ground of maybe Moldova, but more on the ground of EU. What will EU will do uh, in this respect, in this regard. As re regarding um, how economically trans well trans transition citizens, Moldovan citizens in Transnistria live now, um, their situation is quite poor because uh, 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 because they call it blockade. They don't respect Moldovan le uh, legislation. Ukraine somehow impede uh, them to sell and to transport uh, um, goods which are not sealed by Moldovan authorities. So and in this regard, there are some difficulties for Transnistrians to develop their economy. They call it blockade. We name it. Please conform to Moldova, according, please act according to Moldovan legislation, because you are part of Moldova. So this is, according to us, not a blockade at all. Uh, they just must respect the rules. So their situation is a bit worse than it was before. But still, I would say that the situation, on, economic situation on the left and right bank of River Vistra is roughly equal. So there is no not big discrepancy between, between us. Uh, yeah, this would be my conclusion. And just one, two words regarding some remarks. Yes, I told you that uh, we would like to solve it peacefully. And I know that many conflicts could be solved in a violent way. And I mentioned that uh, in Ukraine and in South Asia, in Georgia, they tried to do it to, deep, to unfreeze the conflict. So, frequently, Parts try to solve it in a violent way, but in, we in Moldova consider that this is not a solution and we see the consequences of how to solve it in this way. And of course, Russia could be considered as a big problem for Moldova, but again, we define it in a different way. Our main problem with Russia regarding transnational conflict is to remove the troops, the former 14th army from the territory of Moldova. This will be a real sign that Russia is changing its attitude and it could create premises for uh, durable settlement of the, of the conflict. I will stop, I will underline what Mr. Chura uh, was saying about blockade. There, are, there is no blockade. Please note that. You should know that even uh, many years uh, in the past, an important number of uh, legal entities from Transnistrian region, they have been legally registered in Chisinau, having no any problem, no any legal problems, because they are legal entities of the Republic of Moldova, having full rights and full freedom for import-export operations. So, only the politicians and only probably some entities that would not like to be registered legally in Moldova, they are speaking about blockade. But unofficial export, unofficial economic operations, this is nothing else than uh, uh, smuggling. Ukraine is blocking smuggling operations, and this is good for everybody, for Europe, for neighbors, for Moldova, and even for Transnistrian uh, uh, region. We are pledging for the legal, free, open, transparent that uh, allows to everybody to develop uh, economic activities. This is important to say. Second point, concerning the status, I will present to the official position of uh, the parliamentary majority of Moldovan authorities. Yes, we have a special law and uh, we are ready to discuss the largest possible autonomy as status for Transnistria. Let me please explain why the ideas, not only about confederation, but even about federation, uh, is not accepted by Moldovan authorities. This is a real threat 
for the existence itself of the sovereign and independent State Republic of Moldova. As I said before, Transnistrian problem doesn't have uh, an ethnical origin. Now, while, stu while studying, speaking about federation as possible model for Transnistrian dispute settlement, I should say you that immediately an other entity, the uh, Gagosian autonomy, will claim for the same status a part of federation. The problem is that together with this claim, will start to treat the problem not from ideological point of view, but automatically from the ethnical point of view. After Gagos people, Bulgarian people will start to claim for the same status. After them, Ukrainians, we have some 300,000 Ukrainians. This is the big danger uh, at the bottom of uh, this model. This model is not viable for us at all. Uh, this is why we are in favor of keeping the sovereignty of Moldova. Moldova is and always be sovereign, independent state. We are not speaking and we do not envisage some other models uh, for the future of uh, our country. Please not that. Uh, we made another, let's say, concession, not concession, but we are ready to pay a price as necessary uh, condition for the resolution of this problem. I mean here the status of neutrality. We understand how sensitive for the region is the item uh, related to defense and security. This is why neutrality of Moldova is not sufficient, but from our point of view, very necessary ingredient in promoting the peaceful uh, way um, of um, Transnistrian problem resolution. Uh, Mr. Varikis is uh, absolutely right by saying that theoretically is one thing, practically another thing. Um, the way of negotiations is a long one, very difficult one. You are absolutely right. While speaking about political will, the meaning of my idea was exactly the meaning of your statement. The key for the resolution of this problem is not in Turaspo. The key, unfortunately, is not in Kishina. The key is outside of Moldova. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let, me, let me thank you once again for your uh, presence. Uh, probably I did a mistake at the beginning uh, because I know many of you. I didn't make my own presentation. I only now understood that many of you didn't know me. My name is Mario Lupo. I'm the new leader of Moldovan delegation to PASE, member of uh, uh, the Parliament of Moldova, former speaker of Moldova Parliament in two mandates, and former acting president of uh, the country. Uh, this is the first side event that we decided to organize, dedicated to Transnistrian issue. Uh, we'll be ready in the future uh, to be here with presentations on different, sensitive and important for our country and for the European part of Moldova, important uh, issues, and I count on your uh, interest and participation. Thank you very much again. I remain at your disposal, together with uh, Madam Ambassador, to our mission here, uh, in order to answer quickly uh, all your questions of interest concerning my country in different uh, fields, because like that, I understand uh, the meaning of partnership. Thank you very much and have a nice day.